Hello, everybody. Good evening, and welcome back to the Nomen live stream. I'm your host, Adam Hartel, and what we were just watching was the Nomen 2022 uh, student reel, all student work from our school in Hollywood, California, where we're training artists for careers in games, uh, animation, and visual effects. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you guys to tonight's event, Environment Creation and the Future of Game Development. Um, and to introduce our guest this evening. Uh, but before I do that, just a little bit of housekeeping for you. Um, first, I'd like to thank Lenovo for sponsoring uh, today's event. Uh, because of Lenovo sponsorships, Nomen is able to continue bringing these streams with free educational content, demos, etc. just kind of the heartbeat of the industry uh, to you guys. So thanks to Lenovo for that. Um, additionally, we've got something special this evening, uh, the Nomen Workshop, uh, which if you're not familiar with the Nomen Workshop, is essentially an online library of well over 300 uh, lengthy uh, workshops and tutorials by some of the industry's top talent. Uh, and the Nomen Workshop has provided us with a discount code for tonight's event. Uh, that code is uh, Payton20 uh, in, honor, in honor of our guest. And uh, my colleague will get that in the chat for you guys. But this code is going to be active from today, April 21st, and is going to expire at 11.59 p.m. Uh, UTC on April 28th. So the next seven days, that code is going to be available. And what that'll do is give you a 20% discount on the first month of a new monthly subscription or if you choose to subscribe to a year in advance, you're going to get 20% off that first year subscription of a new annual subscription. Uh, and new customers are going to be eligible for a free trial. Uh, the discount will simply apply to your first payment after the trial ends, providing that you start the free trial before 1159 p.m. on April 28th. Uh, and the last thing I'd like to mention is we're going to be doing a giveaway uh, for tonight's event. Uh, so. We are giving away a six month subscription to the Nomen Workshop. Uh, and the way that that works is simply everyone who RSVP'd for tonight's event on Eventbrite will also be entered into a drawing to win a six month subscription to the Nomen Workshop. And the winner will be notified via email with details on how to redeem your subscription. Uh, so if you uh, RSVP'd for tonight's event, on uh, Eventbrite, uh, you have the possibility of receiving an email saying, hey, guess what? You've got six months free. Uh, so that's pretty cool as well. So thanks to the Nomen Workshop for that. And with some of those details out of the way, I would like to introduce our guest this evening. Uh, Peyton Varney is an environment texture artist from South Alabama, currently working at the AAA game studio Naughty Dog in Santa Monica. He contributed to The Last of Us Part Two, uh, published by Sony Interactive Entertainment for PlayStation, and prior to that worked on Marvel's Spider-Man for the PS4 while interning at Insomniac Games in Los Angeles. Peyton enjoys sharing his knowledge with others to help game artists understand the basics of creating professional quality work. And with that, uh, welcome Peyton. Thanks for uh, thanks for being with us this evening. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, having me. Um, yeah, appreciate absolutely. The introduction. For sure, yeah. No, I'm actually really excited because you're gonna be you're gonna be digging into some stuff that you've done uh, in Unreal Engine Five, and mm -hmm. being an environment artist yourself, you've probably been able to really dig into those features and and make some really cool stuff. So I'm excited not only to see uh, just you kind of giving us a show and telling what you've made, but kind of hearing some ex explanations about how you've approached it. Um, and maybe just before you jump into that, kind of kick it off. Um, you know, based on your experience on these projects you're going to show us this evening using Unreal Engine 5, which now is, you know, no longer in whatever it was, beta or whatnot, it's like it's been fully, fully launched. Um, how do you feel about that tool set moving forward as an environment artist for AAA games? Yes, yeah, so um, my two Nomen workshops that I actually have uh, were done in Unreal Engine 4. Um, of course, Unreal Engine 5 actually just came out, uh, I think, about two weeks ago. Um, and since then, of course, I was using the uh, the, uh, the early access ones a little bit before that. Um, but with the official one, I was really able to throw some of my environments in there and get a lot more familiar with uh, the, the tools and the tool sets that they're doing with it. Um, and I think overall, like the stuff that they're really adding is going to be uh, monumental for game development and really bringing in a lot of the stuff to where you won't have to use a ton of tools. You can kind of do it in house and it should also speed up workflow as well with that. Awesome. Uh, well, I can't wait to just get into it. So, uh, yeah, if you want to, we can get, uh, whatever the, the first thing is you want to show us, um, 
I will, uh, I'll be along for the ride, but I'm going to hand the mic to you, sir. And uh, you can start showing us around your first project that you want to share to this evening. Yeah, so this one here, um, I'm starting off in Unreal Engine 4 just because I want to talk about a little bit of the, the Nomen Workshop's uh, environments. Uh, and I think overall, like, uh, what I aim to do with this is when I first got started, I was kind of intimidated and scared by vegetation. Uh, and overall, like, it was, yeah, it's just, it's something that can be intimidating because of uh, just how much it is like in everyday life and pretty much every single game has it. Uh, just being able to do it, I wasn't really able to find a, a resource out there uh, that allowed me to uh, easily be able to pick it up. Uh, and so this environment here at least is the, the first one and it's actually a beginner tutorial uh, kind of going over uh, the, you know, the process of getting into vegetation. Um, you don't have to know how to actually make vegetation whatsoever, um, but jumping into this, you should be able to go from uh, start to finish as long as you have basic modeling and uh, texturing skills uh, just with that. And yeah, you would be able to, at the end of the workshop, actually have a full environment, uh, kind of like the one you see here. Um, I did prioritize the vegetation in this one a little bit more and um, didn't you know, flush out the rocks or anything, but uh, that was pretty much the, the whole purpose of that. And then I did also want to actually jump over real quick to um, my more recent uh, Unreal Engine 4 uh, Nomen Workshop tutorial. So I'm going to switch over that now to, and let me grab that one. So yeah, this one should be my, I think, there we go. So what you should see now is the African Savannah. Um, this one came out early this year. Uh, but of course, it is a more intermediate tutorial going into vegetation creation uh, inside of Unreal Engine 4. Um, I will say that a lot of the, the techniques and things that I use in both of these uh, also carry over to Unreal Engine 5. There's not much uh, difference so far with it to uh, where, yeah, the, the engine really matters. It really comes down to uh, just the, the overall pipeline, the process of creating vegetation. Um, but this one's pretty cool because we actually start from absolutely nothing and we uh, create the, the grass, uh, really work on the vegetation and blending and all, um, work on the trees and even some of the, the brush that you see kind of throughout the environment. Um, and yeah, in the end, this one I feel is a lot more like actually flushed out into getting into um, once you've learned the basics, getting into what it takes to create a, a believable uh, environment with vegetation inside of it. Um, so this one is yeah in Unreal Engine 4. And then now what I kind of want to do is actually open these up inside of Unreal Engine 5 and talk about some of the differences between the two and even uh, do a demo with that. So Awesome. A uh, quick question, um, at least yeah. for the, I think for the first one you opened up, you had mentioned that, you know, that for that more beginners tutorial, they won't have to know how to actually create the vegetation and that sort of a thing. Is that because, uh, is it coming with its own assets? Are you using Megascans assets or how's that working? Uh, no, it uh, it has the base like rocks and uh, the the actual block out trees that are kind of the background um, just as like a set. But okay. what we actually do in the tutorial itself is start from scratch and learn how to make the vegetation from scratch. Oh, um, cool. So it's not using any like yeah, mega scans or uh, really anything else. It's kind of going through that process of uh, making um, yeah, textures and the, the vegetation by hand. So one or two. Awesome. Let me open up. Okay, there we go. Cool. So, but yeah, I would say like um, the reason why I, I think it's important to know how to actually make vegetation from scratch and all is because, you know, depending on the project, depending on the studio or whatever you're kind of working on, uh, it's not always guaranteed that you're going to be able to get a license to work with some uh, program or so. And so like if you get to that situation where you do need to make vegetation and um, 
you can basically have that knowledge to where you can make it from scratch. Uh, and I think also just making it from scratch, you can get a lot of benefits from that. Uh, it feels a little bit more uh, painterly just because sometimes you're jumping into ZBrush and painting out the leaves themselves. Uh, and you're just, you're giving that own artistic touch to where it feels a little bit more like your vegetation and not just mm -hmm. uh, someone else's that you're kind of using. Um, but yes, yeah, so this one is actually inside of Unreal Engine 5. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is the lighting's a little bit different, uh, and that's because I do have the lumen enabled. Uh, so it's just getting a little bit better bounce. And overall, uh, it's getting some some nice like effects in the grass itself. Um, nothing is too different because I was already using ray tracing in Unreal Engine 4 uh, for this environment. Uh, but I would say that the lumen did help a bit with uh, offering some more lighting, um, just making the grass feel a little bit softer and more believable uh, in that sense down here. And so, and this one uh, was kind of actually have a, I put both of them in the same project. That way we can open them back uh, up and kind of jump between the two. Um, oh, cool, yeah. But some of those things uh, where we were talking about uh, being able to get some more bounce and all um, is if I actually go to the directional light source and I turn up the indirect lighting intensity that we see here, you'll see that I'm actually getting some more bounce off of these leaves here uh, on the, the trunk of oh, this yeah. tree. And yeah, so for sure. and just overall, the global illumination using Lumen um, yeah, is pretty impressive with uh, that, but that's a little too intense. And then of course, the thing that probably most of you have seen is like uh, someone actually throwing in like an emissive ball and uh, moving that around and having the lighting response uh, bouncing kind of throughout the whole environment with that uh, is cool as well. But um, I think overall these environments yeah, have already contributed from uh, just having the, the lumen enabled. Let's see. Um, and so far, I've noticed not too much of a difference uh, between frame rate and everything. I think the benefits really of Unreal Engine 5 come with some of the stuff like Nanite uh, being able to use that. Uh, but of course, there are some limitations with Nanite and vegetation. Um, so there's some workarounds and I can kind of jump into that as well. I'm going to mm -hmm. open up a demo real quick. Uh, so yeah, I have this blank space. Um, now with Nanite, uh, if you're not familiar, Nanite's kind of the new way that you can bring in a model and it'll read a little bit differently uh, just to keep it simple. And uh, you can yeah, just have a ton of geo. Um, but the, the issue is it's single sided. And so a lot of times with vegetation, you're having two sided uh, materials. That way you can have flat cards and all. Um, so if you were to actually want to build vegetation that works with uh, Nanite, then you would have to make the, the geometry be uh, three dimensional instead of just being like a flat card. Um, and I did bring in a example of that as well. So I'm gonna go down here real quick. So this is my basic grass. And then this is the uh, other basic. And so if I enable this one to be going to right click and hit in Nanite and then enable, um, then this one, oh wait, there we go. So you'll see that both of these are Nanite now. And um, this one is only showing one side and this one's showing both sides. And that's because I made it three dimensional. Um, so that is a limitation. It's kind of going to be tricky with like uh, trees and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's one thing to keep in mind as you're kind of going into uh, UE5. If you are wanting to jump in there and if uh, the purpose of you jumping in there is like, okay, I can save a ton with uh, using Nanite and the geometry in there like that. Uh, there's some limitations at the moment that uh, yeah, might kind of affect that. I uh, just want to encourage our viewers to uh, type your questions for Peyton into the chat. Um, we'll take some time a little bit later in the stream to bring those up. Um, I did have one come in that I think would, would be timely to bring up now, Peyton, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, 
you you had mentioned um, I mean, there's kind of like uh, tiers of you know required experience for the different workshops you've done thus far. Um, and one of our viewers is just asking, you know, how much experience do you need to have uh, specifically uh, for that first workshop to be able to jump into it and not not feel too intimidated by what you're what you're throwing at us? Um, yeah, I would say with the, the first one, at least, as long as you're really, if, if you've been able to open up Maya before and you can, you know, your way around it, you can make stuff in there and you know, a, a basic level of modeling with that. Um, I think that's one thing. And then with, uh, ZBrush, uh, ZBrush is also used for some of the sculpting. Um, but I, I try to keep it very simple that way, uh, because, you don't want to yeah, try to add a ton of things at one time because uh, that's the intimidating factor of it is learning a bunch at once. Uh, sure. So I try to make sure that I break it down to uh, one step at a time, at least with the vegetation creation. Um, and so I think like, especially the first one, if you've uh, made any sort of 3D asset in the past using Maya, ZBrush, uh, Substance Painter, um, or designer or whatever, like you'll be able to uh, really understand that. And I don't think it'll be much of a roadblock for you. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, and for those of you guys who are interested in getting into those workshops, if, if you're unfamiliar with, with some of those, those, you know, things that Peyton mentioned, you know, there's plenty of other tutorials on the workshop you could take advantage of to learn those things, you know, get yourself familiar with Maya with some basic modeling and texturing, and then you can jump into Peyton's and uh, go to town. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, once you get more familiar with the first one, I would say, like, if you've made a couple of uh, just vegetation assets, then the second one, it's not like a huge leap uh, between the two different uh, skill sets, I would say. Uh, really, it's kind of starting from where the, the first one left off. Um, the first one doesn't cover like trees and stuff. And so we really dive into some of that stuff, like uh, creating our, our tree and so forth. Um, and as you see here with my uh, asset library down here, um, this is all of the assets for both environments. And uh, like both environments were made with all of these. So it doesn't take you having a hundred different like vegetation pieces that make up an environment. I would say overall, like, you know, if I'm looking at a jungle, yes, that jungle might have uh, like a hundred different uh, just yeah, types of vegetation, but really I would say pick the most iconic ones, the ones that stand out the most um, and bring those in. So, you know, if we're talking about like the jungle, at least, you probably only going to have one or two uh, like trees and then you're going to have some you want to think macro to micro as well so let's say that we're um yeah just talking about this we i'll actually do this real quick so um macro to micro with my props that i've actually kind of uh, made for this acacia environment or this um savanna is i have the acacia tree which is pretty iconic for the savanna um, and then I have a couple of different types of grass that we make in the environment. Um, and so it only takes like a couple of those. And then we additionally have some larger ones as well. So you want to think like maybe two or three large plants, maybe three or four medium plants, and then think about your ground coverage as well. Um, so you just want to have like a grouping of each of those. That way you can really play with transitions and uh, the shape language between those all. That, that really makes sense. And for someone who's who's not a game artist or a, uh, an environment artist uh, such as myself, um, it helps me to kind of break it into chunks, right? Like what you just explained, sort of you know, rather than seeing all these, you know, gazillion different plants you have to make perfectly, it just kind of break it into chunks, just like a painting. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Exactly. So yeah, like I was, uh, I think here at least the the savanna at least has a lot less medium sized plants. Um, so I have kind of three different types of grass, and then I have some other ones like elephant grass, drop seed grass, and those make up like around the water and some of those uh, where you get some larger shapes. I'll actually jump over real quick to the um, the full environment that way we can talk about uh, that at least where we can see it. Um, so yeah, you can see like. 
overall, there's not a huge amount of variation. It's small size and then large size. Like we have the trees, then we have the grass. Um, but having that amount where we do have some elephant grass along the water, um, we also have some shrubs kind of being placed throughout. And then I also put a lot of detail since the savannas uh, really are pretty flat and plain, making sure that they have a lot of variation in the grass itself. So I do have those uh, large amounts of just different grass types that if I was making like a uh, let's say just an empty field, then I probably wouldn't have that much grass variation um, because there would be a lot more stuff in that empty field. But um, with this, at least, like that's what makes it, you know, a savanna. Uh, so that's what, yeah, what I kind of wanted to push with this environment. Um, but yeah, I wanted to jump back over to the demo. Yeah, round one. Oh, uh, really quickly, I had a question. Um, you know, what would be the ideal hardware spec for the types of environments that you're showing us here that you've, you've done any workshops? Yeah. Um, so I have a nicer graphics card just because, uh, like, doing this pretty frequently, testing out, like, new stuff and all. Um, but I would say, like, with the, the first, like, Biome, uh, it doesn't need a ton. Um, I think the first one I was running with like a 980 uh, for the, yeah, the original um, Nomen workshop. And then the second one, I do have a lot more grass, but if you play with like LODs, really kind of work with um, making sure that you have optimization with that, uh, then I don't think it's, it'll be too uh, big of an issue. It really comes down to like your limitations with your uh yeah with your computer and how far you want to push that since i do have a nicer graphics card on uh, this computer i push it a little bit further and just because i know that it's going to come up people are going to want to know can you tell us you know what what you're running under the hood on your system <laughs> so this one has a yeah 3080 in it um awesome. and then yeah Previous one I had an an eighty in it. Okay, yeah. Um, but I wanted to kind of open up the foliage tool real quick, and I was just going to throw a couple of the assets in here and just show how quickly you can make an environment uh, similar to what we saw in the workshop. So throw that one in there. And let's see, going to also throw this one in here. So and let's say that, you know, I paint it out. I can really control like how much, you know, uh, density that I want mm -hmm. with my, my grass. Um, so we can see here that, yeah, it's already starting to feel pretty full and <clears throat> sorry. Uh, but yeah, so I, I can paint that out. Let me go here. Um, and really like depending on the, the hardware, like what project you're wanting to work on and stuff that can really, yeah, uh, go into effect of how much actual geometry that you're putting into your scene. Um, and so like, if, if I have a smaller graphics card or a, a graphics card that's not as powerful, then I might not put as much grass or I might just be a little bit more lenient with my geometry that I have on my grass um, and kind of think about it in, in that format. So, um, but at least this one, you know, uh, I would say we come down here to player space, like feels a little bit sparse. I can use this one over here as well. Um, and this will kind of fill in the, the bottom area. So we go to 500. Now, in, in context of this, I've got a quick question. Like, you know, for example, when you're when you're painting a scene, uh, traditionally, a lot of times, you know, less is more, or um, there are some real common mistakes, you know, that people can make by overdoing certain things. Um, do you have any, you know, kind of best practices or any kind of guidance that you can give us to make sure that you're getting enough when you're doing something like this, but not kind of, you know, making it look like it's it's just been done to death mm -hmm. um i would say like 
I start with the larger shapes. So mm -hmm. similar with textures or modeling, uh, you want to start with the macro shapes typically, like the big read. And so uh, if I was making this environment again, you know, I'd actually probably start with the, the larger trees. Mm -hmm. And let's say that, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of a shot right here. I'm going to move these trees around to where I can actually like get a nice composition and see how I kind of want this this street and road to feel. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring this one down here and uh, I might also like pretty quickly on uh, set up a camera in my scene. So if I go up here and set up a camera actor, there we go. And I'm going to right click pilot the camera and let's say we want it to be yeah, pretty cinematic. I can do a two and then um, for my aspect ratio. So I want it to be, uh, you know, more compressed uh, vertically and wider horizontally. Mm -hmm. um, and then my field of view, I'm going to uh, compress it a little bit more as well. So now I'm starting to get a decent little like scene that I have going on here. I can move my camera around, think about uh, like, yeah, composition. How do I want the, the player to move and uh, just the viewer in general, like how do I want them to look through this space? Mm -hmm. uh, so this one at least like, okay, we're entering in with the, the road um, from the foreground. You go through the water. Uh, it's kind of this like this river where yeah, maybe vehicles cross through or so. And then you enter out going out this way and then it kind of crosses across. Um, and so just in general right here, we're already having your eye like moving throughout the space and you're getting kind of a view of everything as you enter this space. Um, and so whether it be with your portfolio or when you're talking about a game or project, um, doing this and just thinking about yeah the player and how it would feel to kind of move throughout, uh, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. And when you're, uh, when you're getting ready, when you're doing your research on, you know, putting together, for instance, the, the Savannah here, do you go and just figure out what assets you're going to need and make all those up front? Or do you get into it and maybe use certain things as placeholders and then go make certain assets as you realize you need them? Or how does that typically work for you? Yeah, so I don't know if you noticed it, but I have this beautiful uh, oh, it's fantastic. Here. Yeah. So this is actually like for a bush. It's not for the trees. Uh, mm -hmm. The savanna trees, I think, were a little bit more complex. I don't know if I have any in here. But yeah, generally, I'll, I'll do a super simple like block out um, and bring those in. I'll try to see. I don't think I have any um, yeah, block out in here. But um, I'll do a super super simple something like this. Let's say I wanted this to be a bush. I could, yeah, basically scale it down, and you know, you can really do whatever you want uh, with it. Uh, another thing I'll do is, if I'm in here, actually, uh, sometimes I'll also just make a, a tree itself. So I'm just using the Unreal um, tools now to, yeah, make this. And then let's say that we were wanting to have a. Uh, an acacia tree similar to what we have in this environment. I would probably make a more complex, uh, I would say, block out uh, just because it yeah has better reads. But if you wanted to, just for shape purposes, you could do mm -hmm. something like this and uh, actually yeah build it out. Um, but yeah, I think like that's not necessarily like showing enough detail to really uh, portray. But yeah, you've got that flexibility, though, which is really nice that you can, you know, try to do as much as you can up front, but you may not know what you need until you start putting together the scene. Exactly. So I'll, cer I'll certainly like start with uh, the more basic like shapes like that. I'll have like a large shape like my tree. Um, I'll make a, a simple grass just to see how the grass looks. And then mm -hmm. I'll make a, uh, a, um, a bush or something kind of simple for the, the mid ground as well. Um, so, well, as long as we're talking about it, uh, one of our viewers was just mentioning that they, they always struggle to find the right reference for their biomes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any suggestions on where to go looking for your reference? 
Um, I would say number one, if possible, uh, real life. Uh, so actually like going out and experiencing that biome. Um, if of course that's not always possible, but I think experiencing a biome is like pretty huge because you get to understand like the feeling of what it's like to sit there, you know, um, like what are the sounds like, what are the smells like, what, what makes up like ex being in that biome, uh, like unique to it. Now, of course, like, yeah, it's not always common. Like I, I can't go to African Savannah to make this at the moment. So, uh, typically like just a lot of reference collection, um, gathering it from like Google images, uh, just some other ones. And then I collect it typically in a pure ref, um, pure refs, like I find a lot better than Photoshop. Um, and that's what we actually use in the normal workshop, like video, but I collect it all there. I have a, a good amount of, um, I actually have it pulled up if I could flip to it if you would like. Sure. Um, so let me real quick. So this is the pure ref for uh, the the savanna. Um, so really trying to capture some of the more like iconic trees, some lighting, some mood, um, and just really like I spent a lot of time uh, looking for reference. I think that's something that uh, sometimes people actually like glance over really quickly. Uh, it's just reference gathering and they just want to jump in and make the environment. Um, but reference gathering I find to be you know, one of the most important parts of uh, environment creation. And then, uh, so once I have this too, I, I kind of yeah, break it up where I have a uh, certain reference for my, my grass, my textures, um, my lighting, like I said, uh, just the overall scene in general, like looking at some of these. I think there was another one here. Yeah, some of those. Um, so it's just a huge variety of uh, reference for that. Yeah, Pure Ref is awesome. Um, such a great tool for yeah. putting that together. Now, did you did you just it's the size of those images just the size that it imported into Pure Ref, or did you purposely make certain things larger and certain things smaller? Um, <laughs> this is actually just uh, for you know whatever it kind of brought in as. Yeah, um, no, it almost looked like a thought cloud, like <laughs> like you're like, oh, I need these trees to be bigger because <laughs> they're more important. But okay. Gotcha. I appreciate you giving me that credit. <laughs> sure thing. Um, uh, but yeah, so like you could totally do that where you have like your larger things be more important and stuff. Um, but honestly, I was just throwing in a ton of stuff in here, um, basically just like, and I think, yeah, I kept it at the sizes that it was at uh, because yeah, I wanted that resolution. Um, yeah. And I kind of like remember where things are so I can like fly around and go to whatever I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. um, these are actually some pictures that I took myself of like a uh, Keisha nearby um, nice. that I kind of liked. So yeah, also gathering like reference. I uh, can't remember how many of these, not a lot of them I gathered, but I do tend to gather uh, pretty frequently. Um, it looks like you, you took your, up at the top there, you took sort of your most common pieces of vegetation and you named them. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. So these are the ones that I was actually going to make um, mm -hmm. so I have the acacia tree, Bermuda grass, elephant grass that way. Cause like if I'm down here and I'm looking at this, I have no idea what that is. Like it's, right. <laughs> it's some type of grass. Uh, but overall it's just like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, so like doing the research where you know what it is, um, yeah. and yeah, you can name it. And then that way, like if I need more reference of this, I can just go to Google or whatever and type it in. Um, yeah. And how I typically find these, at least, is I'll go on to Google and I'll uh, I like search the biome that I'm looking for, and basically like look at the vegetation that makes up that environment um, and what's the most common pieces. So if I look up African savanna, and uh, you know like okay, this thing's maybe shown once in the savanna, but it's not super common. Like I'm probably not going to put that in my environment. Uh, because it would be weird that like a rare plant to find there would be all over my environment. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I try to find the more common pieces that make up the the like yeah. environment that I'm going for. Um, yeah, I, I actually really enjoy the reference stage of a project. Um, and I love to nerd out on how other artists, um, what th their thought process is and how they put together the reference because um, there's always something to learn. So do you, do you find it after you do a deep dive on an environment like this that you like you have all this knowledge you didn't have before? Like if you're hanging out with your friends who are like, actually, that's a, that's a such and such from the blah, blah, blah biome. Yeah, I actually have yeah. a, an environment in my portfolio where I went like really hard with that. Mm -hmm. And it has like an airplane and all. And I like found the blueprints of the airplane, found like uh, everything about it, like how many were like actually created, like when it was in service. And it was just like all this needless information, but it kind of helped when I was building the the environment because I'm like, okay, this isn't a super common thing, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and it makes it more unique. Um, Absolutely. And it makes a difference too. Like yeah. I, I, you can totally feel it and see it uh, when you're looking at, a, at a, an environment or a piece of art that the, the person's really done a deep dive like that. Yeah, and I think it, it pushes to like your, your storytelling elements uh, with it because you, you're understanding what goes into a lot of the things that make the environment. Um, mm -hmm. And that way you, like, you're able to put that into the environment itself and uh, give environmental storytelling without having a character there of, okay, like, you know, this thing is here literally because of um, like what happened back when or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of story, uh, one of our viewers is just wanting to know when you're working on, when you're working in studio on a game, how much direction are you actually given about the story of the game when you're getting started into the environment? Um, I think that's honestly like, that's really project based and um so yeah uh, i guess like there's not going to be like a clear answer because sure. it really depends on how small the studio is how large the studio is you know what type of project is it uh, does the studio own the ip is it someone else's ip a lot of that factors in and mm -hmm. so i think um that's really what's going to yeah limit that at least but let's say that you were yeah, I guess uh, overall you're going to like typically you're going to get like a story and that might go to design and the gameplay is going to be built around and then you're going to get block out from design. Um, and so like you're not just entirely like building from like whatever a writer is telling you, you're building from like a gameplay space typically mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, their their games is not like a walking experience. So, uh, you know, in the end, like gameplay kind of comes first and then you, you make that into art. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where, you know, maybe there was less information and you've done exactly what you're talking about and your environment or the way that you put it together actually had a, you know, a reciprocal influence on how they decided to, to take that moment in the game or that part of the story? Yeah, I, th I think the more like open it is, like then you can really just push your creativity as an environment mm -hmm. artist um, as far as possible. And, you know, if you add something in there or whatever, like it, unless like it really contradicts with something in the story, like it's going to get picked up and um, it might just stay in there and like they run with it as like a an element of the environment itself. Um, so I, I yeah i guess it really comes down to how important that section you're working on is um and like how vital it has to be to a certain thing you know yeah. um but overall if it's just an environment kind of in the space and it's more about gameplay or whatever uh you can kind of like uh you know to an extent uh really have your own creative liberty with that um and put you know your own storytelling in there as an environment artist. Awesome. Um, I can switch back to the, yeah, the Unreal environment though real quick. Mm -hmm. There we go. I'm just looking over our, our questions that are coming as well. Yeah. 
Oh, someone want to know what's what's your thoughts on using pre-made assets like mega scans? Uh, do uh, I mean, granted, you're you've got to know what your what your studio is able to use, what you've got permission to use. Yeah. Um, but what do you think about that? Um, I think it really comes down to like what you're wanting to go for as like an artist. You know, if you want to be a prop artist, then making or using someone else's props like probably isn't going to help your portfolio at least too much. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. But as an environment artist, you know, if you want to strictly go for a modeler, then you could use, you know, mega scans, textures if you wanted to, uh, if that's not a priority. But I think it really comes down to what you're wanting to show, because in the end, like if you're showing someone else's work and in the interview, they're like, oh, did you make that or whatever? And it's like, well, oh, that's mega scans. And then the next thing is like also mega scans. Then it's just going to be like, oh, well, like the, the coolest parts of this environment aren't yours. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. and so you don't want to really end up with that, like especially depending on what you're kind of going for. Um, so, yeah. It, like if you're a lighting artist, you know, it makes more sense to maybe like, and you want to build a, a lighting portfolio entirely, it might make more sense to, yeah, just use like uh, environments and all and really just show off your lighting skills. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, yeah, it's definitely like, uh, I guess, based on what like department you're kind of wanting to go for. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, at least here, I was just painting out a little bit of this uh, mm -hmm. for our shot. Um, another thing I can do if I turn this off. I don't recall, I think this is our camera. So let me go back over here. And there we go. Um, if I want, I can pin this down here, which is kind of nice. So now you have your composition and you're actually moving stuff in the environment uh, with keeping your composition. So I can do like this and it's a little bit you know, easier if you're really working on a specific shot, you know, uh, like for a cinematic uh, space or so uh, to you know, work in this format. Um, I could bring out a alternate tree as well. Uh, move around some of these. But maybe I want to push this one back. That way we don't have fighting with our piece. So then I'll push this one. Maybe, yeah, bring it up. So that way they're not like too even. We're almost getting like a triangle of importance. Um, mm -hmm. I could probably even push this one to be a little bit bigger. And so they're not, yeah, they're not fighting for importance. Uh, like this one has a nice silhouette. So like you're looking at this like spot there, but then this one has a bit more like size. And so uh, they kind of complement each other with that or so. But yeah, and then I would just kind of come through and continue with this format where I start with the largest shapes Maybe I bring in some of my smaller pieces, like my, I think my elephant grass. Probably want to paint that one actually because it's smaller. So I'll tend to like with trees since they're so large, I'll hand place those um, because painting them can be like a little troublesome. Um, that's in the wrong one. Uh, just because like I can really fine tune their placement when I hand place those. And then with the grass, of course, I don't need them to be like, it'd be take too long to like hand place all of that. So that's where I'm actually like, you know, using the, the vegetation brush uh, to paint it all out. Um, but I'm going to, yeah, turn this one on real quick and maybe add some grass in the, in the water. But so far, this environment only has like, I think, three, two grasses. Technically, I could probably use one here, uh, this grass and then a tree. Um, and, you know, we could probably run with that and actually get an environment out of it. Um, but of course, like, 
you know, the more that you add uh, to an extent um, can definitely like help like a ton with the, the piece. So. I love watching environment artists work, it, it, especially with, with with the state of things today with our tools. It reminds me of that scene in uh, Blade Runner uh, 2049, where she's using that little device and kind of like creating people's memories. Uh, you know, see I'm talking about? She's just placing things randomly and she's making a birthday cake and throwing candles on it and pretty amazing. Yeah, um, I think I'm, I'm fortunate at least like with the, the time that we're in now, like our tools and everything for environment artists become easier and easier. And something like Unreal Engine 5 even, like, you know, I it looks like this and I'm just quickly painting, like I'm not having any like frame rate issues. I don't have to pre-render it or anything. It's just, it's, it's coming out, you know, pretty. Yeah, but I would guess that that, you know, it allows you to push the envelope in other areas because you're not having to use so much of your time or, or, or those kind of things. Exactly. I, yeah, like I, it's great. I, you always hear that debate about, well, now software can do this. So is this artist out of a job and so forth? But I just see that as the tools increase in their capabilities, you see the art that people are making with them just continue to, to increase um, yeah. what can be done. I think things right now tend to get more detailed and get more uh, like just bigger overall. Um, and so like just since the tools are uh you know providing less and less limitations then we're really being able to like push what we can really achieve both with detail and just dense like size yeah. um and you know that's like a pro and con thing because like at least with unreal engine it's like i could make a huge open world now and like it'd be pretty fast but you know also you could lose an element of like the uh because yeah, to an extent, like if it gets too procedural, um, then it becomes like almost lifeless uh, because mm -hmm. it doesn't have that, that touch. And so I think like there, yeah, there'll be definitely like a happy medium where like you yeah. don't want it to get too big um, because if you have like super big procedural open world, um, but then you don't want it to be too small. So like kind of finding that uh, just right place where it's like, you know, it's it's large, it's detailed, but also it's small enough to where we can enjoy and like really take in all of the the pleasing elements. And it really yeah. has like, yeah, a lot of that in there. But you still need to be able to guide the player. Like, you know, the player needs to understand that I need to keep driving down this road and not get sidetracked and just <laughs> go off into the distance. Um, speaking of the open world, the, the mountains you have in the background, is that geo continuing all the way back to that point or are those cards or, or what is that? Um, so those are like basically really quickly done. Um, so yeah, it, basically it's a single asset um, and we can click on it there. And if I actually open it up in here, this is it. So I don't know. Yeah, you can see that window, right? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of large, but it's a, I probably did it in like, 20 minutes because I, I modeled like a slope out in Maya and then I just sculpted it in ZBrush, like gave it some edges. Um, mainly what I wanted was like when you're far away, I wanted like the, the light to hit it, uh, how we can see like some of those elements really like pushing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's nothing much, but just enough to make it feel like it has a little bit of like depth to it. Mm -hmm. And so... Oh, to your point you're making just a minute ago too it'd be you know what a waste it would be that if you made those mountains insanely detailed with perfect trees all over them just because you could yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, what would be the point um, <laughs> if you're never going to get up to them yeah yeah and that's that's kind of like the working smart not hard where you, you prioritize the player space and really just focus on you know what what needs the detail and um like, yeah, really just placing it where it's only needed. And then the other thing that I'm, I love about uh, Unreal Engine, of course, is the just natural um, atmospheric perspective that you can get uh, depending on how you've, how you've run that. Are you going pretty stock on those environmental aspects or have you dialed all of that in yourself? The, like with the lighting and the fog and all? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll actually, let me jump over. I'll save this scene just in case we want to come back. Sure. And I, you know, I'm, I'm just nerding out on what you're doing. So if I'm oh, sidetracking yeah. you from something <laughs> you needed to show us, like, no, by no, all no. means. <laughs> um, so yeah, with this environment, like overall, the, the lighting, if I go to a directional light, mm -hmm. um, that's really giving it pop. I did overcast because like a fine and like I wanted something different, I guess. Um, overall, like, you know, we're always seeing a ton of like daylit environments. And so I wanted to kind of play with the, the lighting a little bit more. So this one I think is using um, skylights not yeah, being adjusted too much, but with the, the light source, you can see that uh, basically, yeah, changing the overall uh, impact. And then these little light spots that you see here, uh, they're actually just spotlights really high up. So if oh, I fly cool. up here. Um, yeah. And so it's kind of like I could have made uh, this, the light you know, interact with the cloud or something like that. Or I could, for portfolio purposes, like um, just use a spotlight and mm -hmm. you know, make it feel like the sun's coming through the, sure. the clouds. Um, so it gives it that variation where, you know, it's it's a little bit brighter here. Um, if I fly up really high, yeah, it's brighter here, a little bit here, here, and those are just like spotlights, kind of adding some variation to the um, the vegetation. So, yeah, and and aside from like guiding the eye, it also just helps. It, it gives it that added sense of variety to the landscape. You know, especially if you've got a lot of the same type of grasses and stuff like that, that difference in lighting just makes such a huge difference in the overall presentation. Yeah, because I, I think this would be what it would look like without the spotlights. Right. Um, and so there's just like a, a boost uh, mm -hmm. of variation. Um, totally. And um, let's see. Yeah, and then I had like a simple rock again, kind of talking about like, you know, putting priorities. Like, uh, I modeled this rock pretty quickly. It's not like, you know, anything special, but you don't, it's not a, a focal point of the environment. It's just a, like an accessory. Um, and so I didn't put a ton of time in there because it's, it's more about the, the vegetation. Um, and so, like, when you're thinking about scheduling like priority and figuring out what you're wanting to uh, really capitalize on um, because i could put detail in this environment and just keep on going at it but at well at some point you're either just gonna like get burnt out of the environment and quit it or you're gonna run out of time if you're on a deadline so that's really where it comes into play where like you want to focus on prioritizing where you put your detail where you put your effort in um, because you know uh, to an extent as an environment artist in like a certain environment uh, you only like have yeah so much like battery that you might be able to put into it yeah i gotta believe that for some of the the bigger environments that you're spending a considerable amount of time on day to day you've got to like close your eyes at night and just <laughs> see nothing but savannah uh, <laughs> sometimes yeah and this one's definitely bigger um than i originally planned it to be uh i think because at first i was just doing like a single shot but then i really was like well it would be cool if i could do wide angles and mm -hmm. then i kind of like this shot here and like the dead tree and then i like this shot so pretty much it like it just turned into like everything being yeah surfaced. That's, I, and I love that factor where um, because it is so easy to move around with the with the POV in here that you find so many other compositions, you know, that you didn't know you had until you start looking around. Yeah, um, I think that's a little difficult to to do as well. Um, of course, like with portfolio, you know, sometimes you might do it for a specific shot. But if you're making a game and you're working on a game environment, like they're not looking at it, the, the player, the viewer is not looking at it from a specific shot. They're looking at it 360 because they're, they're yeah. running around it. Um, unless it's like a side scroller or something where you have like a locked camera, 
overall, you're going to have it to where like the player can look anywhere. And so you really have to think about that, making every little moment like that they look at uh, be interesting and offer something new. Uh, someone's wanting to know um, how you go about memory management when you're when you're creating these types of uh, environments. Um, so one thing is definitely using uh, as much as possible, and I think the industry is kind of moving towards this, but moving towards tiling textures and like trim sheets and all, um, mm -hmm. because if you're trying to bake out every prop or so, <coughs> sorry, um, if you're trying to bake out every prop, then you just get to a point where, yeah, it's, it's bringing in all these textures. Sorry, my, uh, yes, you have, to kind of, you have to sort of budge, budget out what you're going to spend more of your textures on and what you're what you're going to be able to uh, to save some memory on. Yeah, exactly. Um, so like if you're if you're making out every single prop, you're bringing in like a, a texture, like a, a base color, a normal map, um, ambient occlusion, yeah, roughness, like all of those things. And each of those things like that's memory. And so if you're using tiling textures, trim sheets, uh, those assets are kind of using those together. And so it's just one call for that one material. Um, so kind of going towards that, like you can really capitalize off of saving memory as well, just by limiting the amount of unique textures that you have in your environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone else would want to know when it comes to the different types of, of leaves in your foliage, do you ever val uh, like vary the translucency or is it all pretty much the same value? Um, the, the translucency with the, uh, the plant itself. Um, yeah. Let me go over here. So it, it really depends on the yeah, I think on the asset. Uh, and then, so typically if you're making a mask or so, like it's it's a white or a black mask. Um, and, you know, that's that's basically your translucency for your, uh, your leaf or whatever, if you're doing it that way. Um, I play more with a thing subsurface, uh, the, the color overall. So if I go over here, you'll see that, yeah, the, the colors of the, the the grass and the vegetation, um, there's a lot of variation in it. And I mm -hmm. think that adds uh, a ton with it. Um, go to overall, like the the actual, I guess, translucency or transparency of it um, isn't necessarily like super different. I just use like a zero to one um, white where I want it, black where I don't want it. Um, but then, yeah, I guess with with like how I want the variation, it more comes down to like the color subsurface and so forth. Got it. So, um, and I can throw a point light here. So this is like the, the subsurface of a, a leaf, um, kind of where it's like coming through. Yeah, wow. But yeah, so you can really play with that value um, and it's going to change things up to like how things are going to be uh, mm -hmm. rendered and everything as well. Um, it can also give some nice dappling down the bottom. And then along these lines, uh, another viewer is wanting to know if you had to put your finger on maybe the most important part or thing that you think through in trying to make vegetation look realistic, like what's do you have sort of like one pointer that you'd say, hey, try to focus on this? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess like uh, the question of making it realistic is like, are you trying to go for a realistic or stylized um, with like the, the art look that you're going for? Mm -hmm. But I guess in the sense of no matter whether you're making it realistic or stylized, 
you do want it to feel grounded and you want it to feel believable um no matter like yeah the the end uh style and so i think overall like looking at reference gathering um of course kind of going back to that and actually yeah gathering as much reference as possible um but then when you're actually going into it Really, I think the difference between stylization and making something realistic is the amount of detail you're putting into it. So a more stylized environment is just going to be a little bit more simplistic where you, you start with the macro, you start with some medium shapes, and then you might like hold back on putting those micro shapes in there. Um, mm -hmm. In a more realistic environment, you're doing the macro to micro uh, where you're putting those micro shapes in as well. Um, so it's almost like a level of how much like, yeah, detail you're really putting in there. Um, and of course too, like you can make it feel more painterly or whatever, if you're doing like Photoshop painting or something with textures. Um, but I think really when it comes to, you know, how, how to make it feel believable, it's just kind of following the reference. And even if you're like kind of going off path a little bit and being inspired by it, make sure that you have elements that make up that and make it feel believable. Like if I'm making an alien type of tree, like we want it to feel somewhat grounded. So, uh, and at least familiar to us. So you could, you know, go super crazy. Um, but if you wanted to have that grounded element, I would say like having elements like, you know, the trunk and how branches kind of branch off. Um, and those basic, like, just macro uh, ideas to it um, are the more important parts. Mm -hmm. And I know in uh, character art, for example, you know, if you're not careful when you're doing these kind of things, you can quickly get into that uncanny valley type of territory. Uh, is, is there a similar danger zone like that when you're doing environment art? Um, yeah, I think, like, with not i don't think as much at least uh but i would say like color really plays a factor into it um making sure you not like oversaturate stuff uh, i think that was a big issue um just with me originally with vegetation was i would always like oversaturate my base colors and so it would feel not like candy but almost like toyish uh, because mm -hmm. of the super vibrant like uh, notes. And even if you like look at stuff that is more vibrant, like I would say like flowers, of course, have a lot of saturation in them. Um, but the rest of the flower doesn't like the, the stem and so forth, the leaves with it. So you can have those saturation elements in certain areas. Um, but if you have saturated, like in like overall in your environment, uh, that can kind of mess with your, your vegetation, I would say. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, it's it's similar kind of thing, even in photography, like when I was early on when I was doing photography, you know, you get your hands on great tools, and you start oversaturating things, or you, you overblow, you know, the the bouquet and things like that in the background. And, and just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I would say to like, uh, I guess, what was I thinking about the, uh, oh, um, I guess scale and proportions. Um, that's another issue with environments where it can feel uncanny where, uh, and I think that's kind of similar with characters too, where like if your proportions are right or your scale's not right in an environment, like it's gonna feel really off. And so if you're running around an environment um, and the door is like, you know, super small or super narrow and tall, like, unless it's purposeful, like it's, it's going to feel off. Um, mm -hmm. and so you want to still be grounded, even if you are doing stylized, um, to where like a lot of your proportions are more accurate to what we're familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, one of our viewers was curious to know, you know, given the time that you've had in UE5 now, uh, they want to know, would you recommend going forward sticking more with the new tools in Unreal Engine 5, like Nanites, et cetera? Or are there some drawbacks when it comes to like hardware requirements and stuff like that? Um, I think, I know like at a base level, uh, it's a little bit in more intensive on the hardware. Uh, I can't recall, you know, uh, exact numbers, whatever. 
but I know like UE5's editor itself is a little bit more intensive. Um, but that's like kind of minute. And I would say if you're already like making environments in here and they're not running like super low frame rate, then you sh probably should be fine. Like, you know, between picking between the two. Um, I think what comes down to like, I really like the lighting in uh, UE5 and those benefits. Um, I would say like overall it's improved the, the grass and stuff in this environment. Uh, some stuff that, yeah, will like take some getting used to is like they uh, remove tessellation at least um, to where you are doing a more geo-based or landscape-based. Um, so like I actually had some tessellation on this ground here and now it's gone um, because it's in UE5. Uh, which isn't a, a huge deal, but uh, it's something to at least factor in is if you're wanting to do like blends with tessellation in it and vertex painting and stuff, um, there's not like the easy way that you are familiar with in UE4. And so that might just get some, uh, take some getting to used to. Okay. Um, and then uh, let's see. Uh, another viewer is wanting to know how are the PBR workflows, um, how much are the PBR workflows still in use with Lumen and Nanite in UE5? Um, I would say like they're pretty, it's pretty similar. Um, I think some of the stuff that's kind of being uh, switched over to that is like now you could just use ray trace uh, like immune occlusion and stuff so you wouldn't need to like bake a an ambient occlusion map and actually apply it to something. Um, if you are using ray tracing, you could just use like that. Um, so I think there's some things with ray tracing at least uh, that are allowing you to eliminate like one of the PBR maps or so uh, in your environments. Um, but I would say like it's it's pretty close to the same still uh, overall um, with that. Yeah, and then uh, any recommendations on camera settings? Do you find that you generally use the same type of ca camera settings each time, or? Um, yeah, so I always, well, for like quick stuff similar to what we we're doing here, I'll mm -hmm. use just like a regular camera, and then I'll I always turn the field of view down because ninety is more like an eyeball. Um, so it's like if you were walking around as a character. And so it doesn't feel as compressed as like a camera lens. Um, I personally am always like a cinematic person. So I tend to have an aspect ratio that's a lot more cinematic. Um, mm -hmm. I would say also that kind of lends to environments, like environments are more landscape. So you tend to shoot that way. If I was taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower, it probably wouldn't make sense to like take a cinematic or yeah, like a wide shot of it because sure. it's a lot taller than wide. Um, so I think at least with this, if I'm working quickly, like, you know, I'll have a bunch of cameras that I play around with and have them at different locations. This one's, you know, looking at the river. This one's looking here. I have one, I think, back here as well. Um, so just like a bunch of yeah variations. These I wanted to be a more wide shot, so I changed the field of view to be much wider. Um, mm -hmm. That way, it felt yeah more like a a wide shot. Um, but I'll I'll tend to just use the basic ones. Um, if you want to get more complex, you can then add like a a cinematic camera actor, and that's where you can really play a lot more with like depth of field and. Uh, stuff that you're more familiar with, with like an actual uh, camera from real life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then uh, another viewer is just wanting to know if you have any advice or tips for artists looking to get into game environments. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that they're asking, you know, wanting to get into working professionally uh, as a game artist. Yeah, um, I would say, honestly, like, uh, I guess one thing that I I like is like really trying to put storytelling in your environments. I think that can help you stand apart and really make yourself unique because you have something that's not just, you know, a an environment you've seen a thousand times online or whatever. Like it's something that you've kind of uh, built out yourself. You have this idea and all. 
Um, I would say additionally, like for me, I, I kind of enjoy like doing things that, uh, yeah, either speak to me that I'm passionate about or like stuff that I have like, uh, experience with. Um, so like, you know, collecting from your real world experience, like one of my first environments at least was, uh, like a part of the United States where I visited when I was little and I would always go there. And so it was like, it was easy for me to work on because I was passionate about that location. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think, uh, in the beginning too, just having that passion and, and kind of putting like, it's, it's telling who you are as an artist, um, and showing like your individualism to where, you know, you're not just like another, uh, like hallway or something that you see online. Um, of course, like, you know, you can follow trends and everything, but I, I like the uniqueness of, uh, you know, trying to tell more about who you are as an artist, uh, through yeah. your environments. Do you have any go-tos, uh, for yourself personally for inspiration? Um, when you're needing to get that spark or getting inspired for storytelling? Um, I, I think it's cool to actually like, uh, at least start with, you know, making or coming up with an idea for, uh, who the character might be that's living in the space. So like, you know, no matter what, like, even if you're not making a character, uh, an environment is kind of owned by a character, whether it be an animal, a person, uh, a vehicle, whatever it is, like, it's typically something inhabits that environment. And so thinking about the character that actually lives in that environment and building the environment based off of that, I think can really lend itself to uh, putting a lot more like details and uh, like unique and cool things into the environment. Um, so like, you know, if you're making a, uh, yeah, like a workshop, um, I'm just using an example of like one of my workshops that I had, um, I, I didn't just think about, you know, what is this workshop? I thought about who owns this workshop, who, who lives in this workshop, what do they use it for? How old are they? Um, you know, what is their story? And so you never see that person, but the thing is like, you are seeing it, like you are seeing that person through the assets that you put into that environment. Um, and this kind of goes back to the, the, like the fun and the, the, the passion of making a new environment is like, if you're just making an environment to make an environment, it's, it's going to be hard potentially for you to get motivation. Um, but if you're making an environment and you start getting attached to the, the person or the story that you're trying to tell, like you're going to put a lot more love and care into those assets, into those textures. And you're going to make an environment that really like kind of shows who owns and lives there, whether it be human or not human. Yeah, totally. And I mean, and just to give props to, you know, some of your professional work, having played um, The Last of Us 2, I've got to say, like, particularly in that franchise, I would say that the environments are almost characters unto themselves. Like there's so much you have to learn about what you're getting into when you step into a new environment in that game. Um, yeah. And there's so many reads, you know, because you're, you're trying to see, you know, are you up against, you know, human opponents, zombie opponents, what's going on, you know, what kind of signs you're looking for. So yeah, definitely masterful. Um, not only storytelling, but I think just like that immersion uh, that helps you, like just try to stay alive <laughs> as you're looking at the environment yeah, yeah for sure um because i mean you know if you're making a, a bigger form game or whatever too it's like um you know you can only play through so many like certain types of environments so like uh if you make a, a game that's you know larger or whatever it it kind of has to be where there's a lot of unique elements and there's a lot of like refreshing moments where you're getting a yeah fresher breath of air and you're really being able to see um, you know, whether it be abandoned or not, you're being able to see like who once lived there or who does live there, even mm -hmm. if they're not in that space. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, and it's such, such a big part of, of the game gameplay, uh, particularly in that game. Um, uh, someone's wanting to know, uh, it's sort of a twofold question. I think maybe it's a question in anticipation of, of putting together a portfolio. 
Um, are there are there any trends or things that you're seeing just really get overused right now? And then um, the sort of the flip side of that, are there any things that you see that commonly get neglected um, in people's work uh, that could potentially bring it to the next level? Um, <laughs> uh, I guess what I would say to that really would be like the trends that um, I think that really comes down to like, if, if you have a trend, like trends work for, you know, if you want to like get likes or whatever. Um, but in the end, like, uh, I think following a trend makes it less unique to who you are. And so really I would say what people sometimes neglect is making art that's their own. Um, and so I would, I would say like what I would like to see more is just more art where it's actually coming from that artist and that person. And it's not just following a trend that they're not really attached to. Um, because yeah, I, I understand why trends work, you know, like everyone jumps on that bandwagon. Um, but also like, you know, you got, you got to think about like where artists and stuff too is. And if you're wanting to stand out, like, really showing and representing who you are as an artist, I think is, is huge uh, is somewhat, and sometimes neglected. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, and granted, like, you know, uh, using The Last of Us again is a, is a very beloved IP, you know, and you when, you when a game like that drops, of course, you see a lot of like very Last of Us looking concept art and a lot of Last of Us looking environments. But if you're really passionate about that, even just taking that, but then uh, twisting it a little bit, you know, t t telling that, telling a similar story in a completely different environment, you know, bend yeah. it towards sci-fi or, you know, <laughs> what would it look like if this happened in a completely different time in history? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, I did I, I, just before I, before I move forward, was there anything that you have not been able to get to yet that you wanted us to see? Tonight? Um, not necessarily. I have another like Unreal Engine 5 environment that I could show that's a lot more um, interior space and stuff. Oh, like yeah. That. Yeah. I'd love uh, to see that. But yeah, I don't necessarily have anything in there specifically that I would. Uh, yeah. But there might be questions about it. But sure. Could, yeah. Let's definitely take a look at that. OK. I'm going to have to open it up real quick. Um, while you're getting that open, if if you're able to do both at the same time, uh, one of our viewers wanting to know, um, you know, if you would have any suggestions uh, to give to someone who's a junior uh, to try to get ready to be able to uh, work at a place like Naughty Dog. Um, I, I think it really is like making just a couple of environments um, that show off your, your capabilities, uh, whether it be like with modeling or texturing um, and just really, yeah, trying to show those and present it in your environment. Um, sorry, I was turning this on real quick. Oh, yeah, no problem. There we go. I have a, when I stream, I have a hard time doing two things at the same time. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I would say, like, what it really comes down to is kind of what I was talking about. You know, make yourself more unique. Um, don't make, you know, just a, a full portfolio of, like, material balls. Um, I think showing your like in a, a, a unified environment like if let's say you're going for texture art um showing that not only you can make amazing textures let's say in substance designer but implementing those into an environment and actually like having an environment that is unified and works together along with your really amazing textures i think makes your textures like way cooler uh, because it shows okay it's not just looking good in uh like marmoset or whatever that you're showing off in it's actually looking good in a full environment and it works together with this other texture as well um and so because a lot of times like uh even with texturing like you know not every single texture in an environment is like the most amazing texture um i mean that that, that is nice to know how to do but uh, sometimes you just make a texture to like, you know, um, it's kind of going back to that priority thing, like um, to, to get the look there, but maybe it's not super important. So it's just like uh, not as yeah, focused on um, for that environment. Um, so I guess, yeah, to the, the, 
like looking as a more like junior artist, um, really just showing off like unified environments where you have uh, modeling and texturing and them working together uh, in harmony and making like a, a nice and pleasing environment, I think is important. Um, and if you are going for something specific like modeling or texturing, uh, maybe avoiding using like pre-existing assets and all uh, because you want to show off your skills and not like, you know, your like world building skills with uh, pre-existing assets. Yeah, it totally makes sense. This is this environment's really cool, by the way. I feel like I kind of want to live here. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it started as a super small one, um, but then I basically kept on expanding it. Uh, it was actually my Unreal Engine like five test bed. Uh, mm -hmm. It started basically when early access came out and I continued to um, just test things in it. So it's, it's going super slow and I don't really have like a timeline on like finishing it or anything. Um, it's more so just like this is where I try out stuff and uh, mm -hmm. learn like um, and I, I think that's, yeah, a fun aspect of it is it has, you know, textures, it has models, um, it's a little bit more realistic, so I can really, I wanted to get better at lighting and understanding, like, the ray tracing lumen and all. So it was basically yeah, a, just a test bed for me to be able to uh, improve my skills and continue to work on, uh, like, my craft and all. Yeah. No, and I also just like from like an architectural standpoint, it's this great design. Like I love, I love uh, what you're doing with your with your lines, um, yeah. both with the flooring and and with the light coming from the from sort of those those rafters outside. Skylight's great too. <laughs> yeah, I think this one at least, um, and I guess this kind of goes back to the reference gathering thing. Um, I have a pretty huge peer ref of this one, but since it is more realistic and it's an interior space, like it's not just Google images. It's like looking up products or like, uh, like the actual pieces of furniture, everything. Um, and then additionally, like a lot more Pinterest cause mm -hmm. like interior designs, like super common on Pinterest. It's yeah. uh, like making a Pinterest board, of just like interior design stuff. So the reference gathering is not always, yeah, like a cut and dry kind of uh, direction. Um, I'll even watch like YouTube's like videos and be like, I really like this environment. And then I'll take like screenshots out of the YouTube videos yeah. um, of environments. It's, it, it reminds me, I mean, to the uninitiated, um, I don't do what you do for a living, but it's, it's almost like, you know, building your Sims dream house on steroids. Yeah. Like, and then you can <laughs> literally take it as far as you want. Run around with your character. And, That's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I play a lot of like simulation games and stuff. So like, this is very similar to having like a uh, almost a toolkit, similar to like how you would with like a yeah something like Sims or whatever. It's like mm -hmm. almost the same thing, um, just a I, little bit more detailed. I gotta say, I really like the floor. It, the I don't know, just just the lighting, um, what it the the texturing, but also the reflectivity. Um, and then I like the way that you've put the, is, is that, it, I think it's con you've got both concrete and wood. Yes. Um, so on the concrete, ceiling, yeah. um, all through here. Uh, yeah. I love the contrast there. That's great. So, yeah. Base color is pretty simple. Um, but this for a while is pretty rough and I just turned it down a ton because that looks like reflections response, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, it seems to be working quite well with the, uh, the lighting. So if you ever build your own house, you're going to go like literally just like make it as an environment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just um, walk through it in VR and make sure yeah. you like it. Yeah. I mean, I sure. think you can, yeah, you can even grab like, I think the furniture from some stores now online. Oh that's yeah, it's it. true. So yeah, no, it's, it's really incredible. Um, we're all, this is eventually pointing to, but um, yeah, this is great. Yeah, I and think it's great it'll... seeing what's happening. What, what it, this because this is UE5, right? We're seeing Lumen, yeah, yeah in action. Is, yeah, this is Beautiful. Lumen UE5. Um, I don't have, oh, I do have one of them. Um, here, and these are always fun. So, just throwing on an emissive.
Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You can really see like how yeah the the lighting works in the That's environment. A, it, I'm still blown away that this is this is like real time. This is amazing. Yeah. So let me do something a little bit more. There we go. And that's, that's, I mean, as you see right there, that was literally just an amiss of being plugged in. Nothing fancy. Yep. Um, I have this little ball and um, yeah, it, it's lighting the environment. It really starts getting cinematic at this point too, doesn't it? Because now you're not just setting up a great environment. You're really getting into the nuance of lighting and you know, what you have going to do use warm lighting, cool lighting. How is that going to reflect on everything else? And yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And they, they do have a, a mode now too called path tracing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I guess, technically like uh, pre rendered. So it'll change things up a little bit, but you can set the amount that it takes to like uh, render and everything. Um, but it can produce like a, a pre-rendered shot almost. Yeah, um, I haven't played with it a ton, but it's... I mean, look at look at the bloom coming off of the the sun hitting the floor in in the the left of the frame. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, the bloom now is like very nice in here. Like it actually has yeah. like colors in it. Oh man, yeah, that's great. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I mean, this is. Yeah, I, I think this you you saved one of the coolest things for last. This is like we we're going out <laughs> on top now. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I I think it, in as we conclude, I think what we'll do um, as we as we sort of our outro, if you will, is we're gonna play the the preview for your most recent workshop that you did in Unreal Five. Um, but for those who maybe joined us midstream or whatnot. If you could just unpack again really quickly, um, just talk about the three different workshops you've done, including this most recent one, and um, kind of how they build on each other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the the first workshop, uh, it's a, a biome, more of a jungle biome. Um, but what it really is intended to be uh, was like when I started, I had uh, trouble learning like how to make vegetation, super uh, intimidating and everything. And so that workshop really covers the basics of vegetation creation, um, foliage creation and all. Uh, and you start from ne not necessarily knowing anything about how to make vegetation at all. Um, and by the end of it, you can make multiple assets, you know, um, following along, actually making the jungle environment that I have. Um, and the, the scene itself uh, is provided to you as well. So you can kind of get in there and play around. Um, and then after that, once you've kind of played around with the jungle environment, the second Nomen workshop that I did uh, is the more intermediate one, and it's the Savannah environment that we were recently in uh, right before this one. And that one really goes into some of the stuff that we didn't cover in the first one, like how to make trees, uh, how to make uh, more complex grass and grass variation, how to get just not just making vegetation itself, but how to put it into an environment and actually make a believable space and make it feel like, yeah, a natural environment um, itself. Awesome. Um, yeah, and then uh, my uh, colleagues, been, uh, we've been putting up on the screen here, the code that you can use if you uh, want to get a Gnome Workshop subscription, we're offering 20% off. Um, if you want to either get a month's subscription to get in and, and take one of Peyton's workshops. Um, you can get 20% off of a month, or if you pay, you know, for a, for a full year, you also get 20% off uh, that full year as well. Um, as long as you just pull up the date one more time, it's going to be good for the next seven days. Uh, so this offer will be good until 11.59 p.m. on April 28th, um, and that is UTC time. Uh, and then uh, additionally, those of you who registered for tonight's stream uh, or RSVP'd through Eventbrite, we've already taken your emails and put that in a drawing that we're going to be doing. And if you are a winner, we'll be contacting you by email, but you will, um, you'll be receiving a free six months to the Nomen Workshop. So yeah, definitely go check it out. I think one of the things that sets uh, the workshop apart for me, because I also use the Nomen Workshop, is you know we're, we're not just getting information or like how to use a software, but this is with, you know, 
high caliber artists such as Peyton who are, who are doing the work on a daily basis. And you're not just getting a tutorial on software, but you're really getting uh, the understanding of how to craft an environment, how to really put this stuff together and do all the things that Peyton's been talking about today. So thank you very much, sir, for, for taking us through these environments, um, for showing off some of the stuff that you've done. Uh, it's certainly been inspiring um, and uh, we uh, hope to have you back again soon. Yes, thank you for having me. It's been awesome. Cool. Well, thanks. And you have a great rest of your evening. And as we close out, guys, we're just going to roll um, the preview uh, for Peyton's most recent workshop in Unreal Engine 5. But uh, before we do that, I'll just say good night. Um, stay safe and creative, everybody. And we'll see you back here again soon. Hello. My name is Peyton Barnet, and I'm an environment texture artist in the game industry. I will be guiding you through this intermediate tutorial as we take a deeper dive into creating game-ready vegetation assets by hand. In this tutorial, we will get into the details of creating believable, natural grass and how to add variation and breakup to your scene. Additionally, we will jump into creating large-scale trees and the tricks and techniques to make it look good no matter the type of tree that you create. Utilizing the power of Unreal Engine, Maya, ZBrush, and the Substance Suite, we will create a beautiful game-ready landscape without the sacrifice of performance or looks along the way. At the end of this tutorial, you will have an even deeper understanding of foliage creation and the process and details behind some of the more difficult types of foliage to create.